So, all right, let's get started. All right. So you saw, all right, I am Sue Kaufman and I am the manager of the library and I'm introducing myself this time because I usually do the introductions for everybody else. But I have been a genealogy librarian for 35 years. I did not know how to do genealogy when I became a genealogy librarian in Illinois. Um, back in the 80s, when we didn't have the computer, when we had to write letters, we had to look through books. And then I uh, went to the Allen County Public Library in 1999. And I have been with Clayton since 2006 when I moved to Houston. So I do this presentation, number one, because I think it's important that we have a beginning presentation, but then also because I sort of want everybody to understand that there is a process to everything. There's a process to cooking, there's a process to fixing a car, there's a process to everything else um, in this world. And so there also is a process for doing genealogy and you can understand how to do it once you get a handle on what it is and what you wanna know and how to research. So what is the difference between family history and what is it and why? Obviously genealogy is a study of history that focuses on determining family relationships. Who am I related to? Who's my grandparent? Who are my cousins? What, uh, when were they born? When did they come over? And those type of relationships. A family history is a story. And that really is what we are trying to create because we know that when you pull out a pedigree chart, everybody's eyes roll into the back of their head when you start explaining to them. And nobody really just wants to see a page with just names, dates, and places. They want to know about those people that are on that page. And it is a process of research. You start with yourself and you work backwards. And there is a process of questioning, there's a process of discovery, and then it is continually done over and over again. And it is a, a search for a personal past. Um, who is it that we come from? Where is it that we come from? And what role did my family play in their family, in the larger picture of society? And what kind of challenges did they have? And what kind of adversities did they overcome? And once we learn all that, sometimes some of the things that we're going through might not seem to be so bad. Um, if we understand that, like my ancestor that came over from Eastern Europe, the coming over from Eastern Europe might have been on a ship where people would have been so seasick for three months and we didn't have iPads and we only brought an uh, backpack. So understanding that experience lets us learn about the resiliency of our family, if you will. And then these stories to pass on. Even if you don't want to do the heavy duty discovery research, passing on a family story, passing on, I'm going to turn off my, my projector, my uh, screen, passing on a, I can't do it, passing on a story gives the family sort of an anchor, uh, an understanding of their family. And we'll see a little later that I always got a story that my great grandfather came over wearing women's clothing from Russia. And there's some things that I found that actually sort of make that story plausible. But again, it brings the family alive. And then of course, medical history, understanding what is historically uh, in your family so you can maybe uh, work on those or try to avoid those or be aware of those. So as I mentioned, it is a process. You're going to start with yourself. You're going to talk to people that are around. If you are the only one around, then you can walk through the house and talk to yourself and ask people about you. Ask yourself about you and ask yourself about how you remember who was there when you got married, the stories that your parents told you. But if anybody is still around, get together and just talk about events, talk about things, because out of those stories, people will show up. Who was there? When did it happen? What do you remember? Look around the house. What kind of stuff do you have? I actually even have a charm bracelet that has a um, charm on it with my birthday, my mother's birthday, my sister's birthday, but then also there's a charm for the date that my grandmother got married from 1933. So there are clues where you wouldn't think that family history or genealogy appears, 
Um, go to your charts and organization. Get, get organized in what you have. Put in things in piles by families. Look at those charts. See if anybody else has done research. Seek help. Talk to us. Talk to other family members that might have done research. Talk to your friends that are do research. And then find out what's online. What you're actually looking for is stuff that places a person in a time, in a location, an event, in a job. Um, do you have little ID cards from some of your relatives? Um, are there pictures of vacations? What kind of life events do you have of things that are around the house? So as I mentioned, it is a process. What do you know? What do you want to know? What kind of sources will answer your question and evaluate those sources and evaluate those findings that you have? Your job is to learn about the sources that are going to get you the answer to your question. Our job at the library, our job is to teach you about those sources. Our job is to guide you to those sources. And our job is to help you specifically find your own personal past. And it always leads to another question. So the handout for today actually comes in a PDF and it is beginning your research. So your first steps, and you can see just sort of what we talked about, gathering what you have, organizing and decide what you wanna know. Talks about different records, governmental records, birth records, marriage records. You need to learn, are these federal records? Are these state records? And I'll show you some ways that you can learn about that. The census is one of the first places we start. And then of course, we talked about those family documents that you have laying around, funeral cards, obituaries, clippings, newspaper clippings, baby books, all kinds of things, yearbooks, everything that puts a person in a place in a time period is family history related. Interview yourself, interview your family. Well, who were you named after? What were your parents' names? If you have older relatives that are still alive, you can ask them who was there at special events. Because if somebody was there when someone got married and you're talking to your grandfather and your grandfather got married in 1945, 1950, you, and he says to you that his grandparents were there at the wedding, you now know that your great great grandparents were still alive at the time that your grandfather got married. So you have to begin to ask questions and you have to get part of a deductive reasoning is what we call it. If this happened, then this might be what has happened also. If they were there when they got married, that means they didn't die until after that date that somebody got married. So those are the clues that you're looking for. In that handout also is your pedigree chart. The pedigree chart is the most important thing. It is a visual conception of what you know and what you don't know. Some people use a pedigree chart. Some people do mind maps with a center and then lines coming out of it. Whatever it is, the bottom line is, is you need to be organized in some way so you can come up with your research questions. The Pedigree chart on the right-hand side is my pedigree chart, and I have a number of pedigree charts. This is an older one that I know that I did before 2001 because down on the bottom, I say, Grammy, ask how, and my grandmother died in 2001. So I know that this pedigree chart is from before 2001. So see how there's that deductive reasoning? because I know my grandmother was still alive. I know it was after 1994 because my mother died in 94. So this pedigree chart was created sometime between 94 and 2001. The information that is missing also become my research questions, okay? So you can see that I, in this one, don't have where my grandfather Emu got married. I don't have any information about my grandmother, Helen. Those all become questions. Where did Emil, Emil and Helen get married? When did they get married? The missing information that I have for Helen. When was she born? When did she die? Where, does she, where is she buried? So those all become your research questions and your shopping list almost, if you will. So knowing what you wanna know is the key to finding out what you want and knowing what records to access to get what you want. Knowing what you wanna know. 
Who, when did they get married? Who were their parents? Who were their brothers and sisters? That is the key to finding out what you want, that individual level. You wanna work on your family history. You wanna work on your genealogy. That's huge. You need to break it down. You wanna to go to, the, to Target. You wanna to go to Target for the plastic stuff. You want a dish drainer. You want to make a cake. You want to make a German chocolate cake. It's an inverted triangle. You have to get down to that point. And once you create all those questions, that makes you feel as if you're in control and gives you some sort of direction in what it is you're looking at. I want to do my family history. I want to work on my grandfather. I want to know when he died. And that, looking at what you're looking for, the place and the time period, begin to get you into records dependent on what was created at that time period that will help you get the answer to your questions. Your handout also includes this getting started source checklist. It looks overwhelming. You probably, as I, don't know what a lot of these records can do for me. What are the parameters of these records? What do they contain? Will a military record have a birth certificate? Chances are a military record, a pension file, might not have a birth certificate, but a pension file might list when someone was born, might list how old they were when someone applied for a pension. And then you begin to do that research and figure out all those things from the clues. You take what you know to try and figure out what you don't know. As an example, there's all kinds of records, census records, vital records. We're gonna go through a few of these during this presentation, understanding that there are plenty of them and we can show you where to begin to look for, find out how some of them are. The census is the first place. I'm imagining a lot of us here um, have already engaged the census and I know that a lot of us have been doing research here already. I appreciate you coming to a getting started presentation because we can always learn something. So, and for those of you that are new, the census is where we start. The census is a listing of names taken every 10 years. It was started in 1790. The first census for each state is on the zero year after it became a state. So as an example, Texas became a state in 1846. The first federal census, United States census is 1850. Illinois became a state in 1818. The first census is 1820. 1790 only includes the colonies, the 13 original states. So each census lists different things and it is a snapshot of the family at that time. So if you are looking for a child, you will not be looking for the married name of your ancestor. You will be looking for the maiden name of your ancestor. And it's also a way to track movement one 10 year period, they might be in Virginia. The next 10 period, they might be in Ohio. So you can see that they moved and you can look at the census and see where people were born, which also will give you an idea of when events happen. Each census asks different questions. This is what the 1810 census looks like. And this is Virginia, Loudoun County, Waterford Township. 1790 to 1840, the census only lists the head of the households, as you can see here, and everyone is broken out by age and sex and then also race. So these columns are broken up by male and female between zero and let's say 10 years, between 11 and 20 years, between 21 and 30 years, and so on. Female, same thing. And then also there's this column for slaves in these censuses. Excuse me. So you might look at this and think that, oh, that doesn't look too useful because it's not giving me the children's names. Well, you are correct. It is a little cumbersome at times, but family history genealogy is a lifelong pursuit. We can get into the census really quickly and get some answers. But once we get back to a point, there is an intense amount of research and a lot of that reasoning needed. So in Virginia here in these 1790 to 1840, you'll be looking at names, you'll be looking at numbers, and you will have to use some of that deductive reasoning taken from a more recent census to see if that is your family back in, in 1840. As an example, this is 1850 from um, 
Ohio, Morgan County, Meggsville Township. And we can see these families. We can see, in fact, in the first family, this parish family, we see that he was a well digger. We were not getting an occupation. We were not getting an age, a definite age. We were not getting an, a sex in this. So 1850 is the year they start listing out everybody in the household. But we can see, as I mentioned also, this is 1850. So you can see that the adults, Christopher and Emily, and then what seems to be the first child were born in Virginia. So this is 1850. You have a, a, a fourth line, another child who is seven years old, who was born in Ohio. So that means that the family moved to Ohio sometime between 1840 and 1843. The child is seven years old. This is an 1850 census. The child was born in Ohio. That means that child must have been born around 1843, 1842, 1844. That is the migratory pattern that you can see. And that's what you begin to do through deductive reasoning in looking at it. You also need to look at every other column. See column 10, married within the year, additional attended school, column 11, whether deaf, dumb, blind, insane, column 13. When you look at a document, look at a document. Go back to the document once you find a document to look at a document, because we might just be interested right now in this family group, making sure that we're putting this family group in this place in this time period, but we might not even notice these other questions. But if the question is, when did Emily and Christopher get married? Obviously this hash mark is not there. There's not a little hash mark in column 10. They did not get married within the year. They probably got married sometime between 18, before 1840, because their first child is 10 years old. There's how you're learning and there's how you're looking at the material that you're looking at. This is 1930. This is New York, Kings County, Brooklyn. And you can see that there is an inordinate amount of information and information comes each year. More comes each year. Eight, 1930, it asks where someone lived, uh, whether they owned a radio. You can see in the home data that's whether they, the R is whether they owned or rented and whether they owned a radio set. The second R is whether they owned a radio set. Remember, census is socially based. Radios were coming very popular. So in 1930, they wanted to know through society how many people owned a radio. This is the beginning of a story. You can look at this and you can fill in your pedigree chart, but you can weave a story from this, from this document. Actually, the second line is my father's family, the Kaufman, the Emo Kaufman, and he rented, he owned a radio. You can see that he was in Romania. You can see that he was aged at the first marriage. So you can begin to tell a story, Emil and Helen. Emil was 20, Helen was 22 when she got married. They've been married for at least since 1924 because my uncle Carl is there and he's six years old. That's much better than just Emil, 1898 to 1978, right? There's a story. So the census is one of the best places to start, and I know it's pretty quick, but I just want to get you to understand that the 1790 is the first census, the 1850 is the first is the census that lists everybody, 1870 is the first census that lists formerly enslaved people, 1890 unfortunately was burned in Washington in 1921. There are uh, little tiny, tiny pieces that exist, but you, but then you only have a census in 1880 and 1900. So then your question should be, what are the documents that are going to fill in that time period that can help me identify a person in a place in a time period, school records, tax records. See how you begin to think. We talked about variance in questions and variance in the information and reported. And 1940, interestingly, is the only census that we know who took the information, who gave the information. In 1940, there's a little circle with an X in it next to the name. And that's the person that we gave, that who gave the information. 
every other census we don't know. That's why you need to take everything with a grain of salt. Because when someone gives information in a census, the name could be spelled wrong, the dates could be spelled wrong, the place of birth could be spelled wrong. Um, I mean, not the dates could be spelled wrong, the dates could be entered wrong, the ages could be entered wrong, because it could be somebody five miles down the road. It could be somebody on the fourth floor of a tenement when your ancestor lives on the first floor. So everything that you look at has to be taken with a grain of salt until you get the solid document that's going to give you information that you believe is true. The weight of a document, census records. My census record, this is, this is, an, this is an example of a vital record. This is the marriage record of my grandmother and my grandfather, Emil and Helen. Emil and Helen gave the information. We believe they gave the information because when you applied for a marriage license, you imagine that you are standing there in front of the county clerk. It says that she was born in New York. Previous censuses say that she was born in Pennsylvania. I have one census that says Pennsylvania, one census that says New York. I am giving this document, the marriage document, more weight because of that reason, because I believe that she was there in front of the clerk giving that information. So as you engage these documents, you have to decide which one should you believe the most. And in this instance, in this example, I am believing that my grandmother was born in New York. Now, the ultimate obviously is her birth, is her birth certificate. That's the ultimate heavyweight document. Until you find that, this is what we have to look at. So vital records, again, are birth, death, and marriage records. Um, there are civil records and church records. Civil records were often started a lot later than church records. So if you're not finding a civil record for the time period that you're looking for, you might look to see if, there's a, if there is a church record or religious record that might list, list a baptism or a birth or a death or a marriage. As the example of each state started keeping these records at different times in Texas, birth and death records were not accumulated until 1903 in Austin. Harris County where Houston sits did not, did not send their records until 1908. Illinois birth, death, marriage records were accumulated in 1916. In Texas, Marriage records were not sent to Austin until 1965. If you're looking for a marriage record prior to 1965 in Texas, you need to know what county you're talking about. You should identify the family in the census and that would be your clue to what county you're talking about looking for a marriage record. Learning about when vital records were collected and did county collect records prior to the state collecting them, are there church records? Are there civil records? Is another thing that you need to learn to do. So each state also has different rules about accessing to them. Um, in Massachusetts, you can get a, you can view birth, death, and marriage records pretty much right after they happen. In Texas, they hold birth records closed for 75 years. Marriage records are closed, I think, for 25 years. So there are stipulations that you need to learn about and what is accumulated and what time period is accumulated. Marriage records are the ones you're gonna find the most, more than and they go farther back. Land and deed records. And land and deeds, if your ancestor owned any land or property, often there will be records for it. And it can be useful in distinguishing between two people of the same name in the same area when you begin to look at the grantee and the grantor, who's buying, who's selling, and you can look and see if there's any attachment by names. That could limit out some of the people when you read the document itself, as you start reading some of these heavy duty manuscript handwriting documents and you look at them, you can begin to notice if you're noticing names that might be common or that might be familiar to you, then you believe you have the right period, the right, the right person. There's also indexes and deeds that are accumulated by location. You'll often find the date of sale, the date that the sale was recorded, the grantee is the buyer, the grantor is the seller. 
the county and state of residence, the amount of money, the property description, the condition, their signatures, if they were there. Also, sometimes I have seen if there is a family cemetery on the property, when that property is sold, often a family cemetery might be mentioned in that document saying that there is that cemetery on there. So land and deed records are another year, you know, that's not an every 10 year document. You can look through the county to see if there are land and deed records. Wills and probates give names and sometimes relationship. If a person did not write a will, there's usually a probate record or a court record to settle the estate and then all heirs are listed. So you can go in and look at the county. Usually the probate and the will are done in the place of residence. My father died in Wimberley in Hayes County. His will is probated in Florida where he was a resident. So that you need to watch that too. So there are books, there is Family Search Microfilm and we'll talk about some of these other sources where to find some of these things. Military records, there's service records, there's pension applications, there's draft cards, there's bounty land grants. People were given land for service. You can find these at Ancestry and Family Search and I'll show you some things, but again, in that document, it's a federal document. So you have to learn what is this document going to do for you? It might, in a pension application, it might list children. It might be a widow. In a draft card, it might list who a parent is. In a service record, it probably will tell you what, uh, what unit they were with, some of the activities that they did, but often it is a federal record. So it is not a birth record, it is not a death record. And as I mentioned, you might not find them in the file, but you might find a clue that can help you get the answer to your question. There are also newspapers that you can use. You can find great things in there, vital records, court reports, social events. Remember, newspapers, especially historically and currently, are the reflection of the time that was going on. But because we didn't have television, we really didn't have telephones, and we shouldn't have smartphones, we didn't have computers, if somebody visited somebody, it might be in the paper and you really have to spend time reading those papers. A lot of them are digitized and then some of you might have to do research with the library that owns them. Most papers that have been digitized are pre-1924 and you run into this with newspapers and books. 1924, 1925 is a secret date because all those materials are in public domain pre-1924, pre-1925, which means that you should be able to view them. When you begin to look for newspapers and you're looking for 20th century newspapers, that's why Ancestry has them. That's why newspapers.com has them. A lot of them are still under license and are only digitized through subscription websites. However, it might behoove you to go to the library where you're researching to see if they have digitized some of their own newspapers. As an example, the Quincy, Illinois, the Quincy Public Library has their newspapers on their library website and they might have digitized more recent ones. So working with the library where you're researching beyond family search, beyond the big guy subscription dates, getting down to that local level to find out what is there or where things can be accessed, not in the big guys is important. So some of the advantages and distant and challenges are if a newspaper says that they've got like the Galveston newspaper from 1850 to 1909, and you start putting in a date, but you're not getting the results that you want, is it because the 1850 to 1909 really is only five images, but it covers that time period? Learning about what's in a database, what's in a collection is one of the most important things that you can do. If you just put a name in what I call the magic box, and you'll see I have a magic box picture in a second. If you just put that name in the magic box, are you not getting what you want because you're not putting the information right? Because it wasn't indexed right? 
or because there isn't even anything that you're looking for. If you're looking for a marriage in Mississippi in Ancestry or Family Search, is there even Mississippi marriages for the time period that you're researching? So understanding what the database, what the collection contains makes you a more effective researcher. Microfilm locations, again, that's talking to the local library where you're researching. Just as an example, this is um, uh, some newspaper articles from one of our colleagues here, Irene. Um, her, Harvey, her uncle um, Harvey actually killed his brother Ambrose while the, while the boys were out uh, to kill a hedgehog, okay? That was in 1903. Um, Irene's uncle, Verl, and friend were charged with placing a stone and a tie on the railroad tracks. And Irene's father fell into the Black River and had to be saved from 1925. So when you get into those local papers, whether they're digitized and available through something called Chronicling America, something through, through Ancestry, through Family Search, through other consortium websites, You'll be able to get more stories, but if you contact the library, see what databases they have, see how they know about where their newspapers are. Tax records is another thing that comes every year, and they're generally at the county level, and they're normally in rough alphabetical order by the county. And often when we think of taxes, we think basically of land taxes or sale taxes, but there are taxes for all different kinds of things. In Ireland and in other places, there were spinning taxes. This happens to be a dog abstract tax from Hale County, Alabama, that is listing in 1917 everyone that has a dog and how much they paid in taxes. So you can use the Family Search catalog and search the word taxes with your location and see what kind of tax records come up and what kind of unusual things. If you're interested in dog taxes, you can go into the catalog and just put in dog taxes and up those came. But remember, revenue generation was very important to a location. So in addition to the regular taxes that we're thinking of, were there window taxes? Were there painting taxes? Were there construction taxes? Learn about the area that you're researching. So where can you find some stuff? All right, now we've seen that there's all kinds of stuff out there. And to recap, the most important thing is do your pedigree chart and come up with your questions. And then you can call us and we can give you information and referral and you become familiar with records that are out there. And I'll show you some um, ways to get a little education in a second. So where can you find stuff? I'm gonna go over Cindy's list really quick, Family Search, our library catalog, calling us. Um, engage your local genealogy society or your local library. Again, these are people that can help you, especially because they will know about the material that is specific to your area. We have an international collection here at Clayton. And so we know a little about a lot but engaging a local library and a local genealogy society is worth its weight in the time period that it takes. On your handout, you'll see a list for Cindy's list. And Cindy's list is basically an index to genealogical resources on the internet. She's been doing this for 20 years, a little longer maybe. And what it is, is it's a categorized list. And you can see, I put up a, a slide there also of topics. There's a getting started topic, there's an Australia topic, there's a link, and these are links out into the internet that will help you find what you need. Some are free sites, some are subscription sites, but understanding and doing specific research and looking for answers, Cindy's List is a great place to start because she has categorized the internet. Now, I know a lot of us are familiar with Ancestry.com, and um, we have Ancestry.com here at the library, and actually the library edition of Ancestry.com with the Houston Public Library card, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, is available through the end of March. A lot of people don't know about FamilySearch.org. FamilySearch.org is a complement to Ancestry.com. There is a duplication, but there all is unique sources. There's also unique sources. And if you are doing international research, we suggest that you use familysearch.org because it is, it is an international collection of historical records 
of digitized images of original records from around the world where more records are added weekly. Not only do they have historical records, there are over 500,000 digital books that I'll show you. There are learning resources and research courses. There is a, week, a wiki. They also offer consultations online. There happens to be a discovery center where you can engage some of your, your uh, family to do some fun things. And you can keep your online family tree and create memories. This is the homepage of Ancestry, I mean, sorry, of FamilySearch. And after you set up an account, you get your own sort of personalized homepage. And um, this is what the top looks like. And then farther down, you can see that I do, looks like there's pictures and there are pictures that I uploaded there and my cousin uploaded also. So FamilySearch is the largest genealogical organization in the world. Their mission is to collect genealogically relevant material from around the globe. It is free access to, record, to resources and services, and it is part of the Family History Library, which of course is part of the Mormon Church. Now, to set up an account, it does not attach you to the church at all. No missionaries will come to visit. It gives you access to records from around the world from an inordinate amount of time period. So you should be engaging Family Search along with Ancestry. When you engage Family Search, initially there are two ways that most people start. You can click on the search or you can click on the question. When you click on the search, down comes a drop down menu where you can click on records. There are images. You can set up your own family tree, genealogies that have been submitted, their library catalog, which you should also use because that is another source to look for books and microfilm. And of course, digital books that come from library partners, including us across the globe, and then a research wiki. If you click on the question mark, you can see that there happens to be a help center there, which will take you to where you can access the learning center. And I have a slide about that in a second. Using the search button and just clicking on search, it brings you to this screen. This is the search the historical content records. There are two ways to search the historical content. This is, on the left, is what I call the magic box where you can put your ancestor's name in and it will bring up all the information that match the parameters that you entered in all the collections that are in Family Search, which is a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing. If you're getting millions of matches, you might discover something that you never thought of. However, if you are directed in your research, you can click on research by location. And what will come up is an opportunity for you to narrow down to your country, narrow down to your state, and then do research in that area specifically. You can click on New York and see if there are any marriages that cover that time period that you're researching and how many marriages are in that collection. So you begin to see if in fact that may, might be useful to you. You can look and see if there's any church records. You can look and see if there's any vital records, any land records. So searching both ways is good. The one on the right is a little more directed and narrow by location, but it's important to do both. When you click on and you go into New York and you see that there are wills and deeds and it says how to use this collection, again, learning about a collection and what it can do for you can help you decide whether you need to search in it or not. When you click on that collection, learn about that collection, it takes you to the Family Search Wiki so you can learn about what it is you're going to begin searching in. Are you getting results because you, or aren't you getting results because you're not searching effectively or is it not even what you need? So becoming educated in what you're researching is super important. In addition to that, in that drop down menu, you can click on Wiki. And if you're going in to do Revolutionary War research, if you're searching in Alabama, if you're searching in a different country, you can put that in and up will come a Wiki page with information on how to research in that area and hot links to sources that you can search. So there is a lot of education right there. And as I mentioned, FamilySearch also has the FamilySearch Digital Library. 
There are over 500,000 books in the Family Search Digital Library. Now, when we went through, let me see if I can go back for a second. I can't go back. Oh, yes, I can. I can go back. When you do this search and you click on the historical record search and you do that magic box search, it does not return matches in the book pro in the book project. You have to search the Family Search Digital Library separately. It's not what we call a federated search. So you can do the magic box search and then you can search the books. There are books from our library. There's about 20, 25,000 books from our library, from the Allen County Public Library, from libraries in Arizona, Pennsylvania, in Canada, in the United Kingdom. They are all completely digitized. So when you put in a name, when you put in a location, up come results, and then you can get into the book and you can read the book. So that is the Family History Book Project, the digital library. You cannot search it from the, feder from the magic box search. You have to search it separately. So why you are looking for family history books and you can't get into the library, I have just given you 500,000 books that should keep you busy until our doors open. And unfortunately, we have no idea when that's gonna happen. Let's just lay that out there right now. Call us and email reference. When I mentioned the question mark that was up on the home page, this is what takes you when you get from the question mark on the home page. You can access that learning center. You can see that there's the arrow there for the learning center where there are videos, blank family tree charts, um, videos on handwriting, on doing German research, on all different kinds of presentations. You can access the research wiki from this area. Remember I mentioned research advice, specific articles. There's a community center also that you can access. So you can work with somebody that may be working in the same area. You can ask questions of con consultants. And then of course you can also search there. I mentioned doing things with your family. Family Search has family history activities, and I know my picture is a little dark, but what it is, is, is there's a bunch of different components. There's games, and then there also is ethnic costumes. And you can take a picture from your computer. You can choose your ethnicity, and you can take a picture from your computer, and you put your face in that picture, and then you snap a picture, and then it becomes that this is what I would look like, I suppose, although my face is very dark, in Russian costume, in my native costume. So that's a way to engage um, people that don't want to look at a pedigree chart, to engage youth, to get them involved in family history and passing down those stories. The next thing is, of course, you can create your um, own family tree. And there also is a section there for memories. These are the pictures that were up on my homepage and I have those in my memories and you can share them with other family members. So that becomes a place to put digital images also. You can create a family tree and you can add sources. This is my great grandfather. Um, and I have added sources, no memories, no photos, but you can do that there too. So there are, it is kind of a one-stop shop and, you know, people wonder sometimes where should you keep a family tree? Family Search is not a commercial entity. And so I have a little more, I suppose, faith in knowing that Family Search will be around for longer than Ancestry, just in case something happens to Ancestry, because it's a commercial entity. There are also, there are also software programs. I do not use one. We are looking at maybe doing a presentation. And I think that once I say this, everybody will say, if you really want a presentation on software programs, put it in the chat and Joy and I can work on that. And we'll do that. So Family Search is a free site. 
It is a compliment to Ancestry.com. There is a lot that you can do there, and I wanted to highlight that. But now what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to quickly go through some of the things that we have here at the library that you can access. So we are one of the top research collections. Uh, we have an international collection. We have county histories and materials at the county level. We have things at the national level, and we have things at the international level, again, with material that is going to put a person in a specific place in a specific time period that is guided by the questions that we have. Material go back to the colonial time period. We also have county records, voter records, court records, guardianship records. We have microfilm materials and we also are an affiliate of Family Search. So what that means for you is, is later on when I show you um, our contact information, if you begin using Family Search and you start looking at those historic records and they are restricted and a dialogue box comes up that says you need to be in a library affiliate, a library partner. We are a library partner. And if you are engaging Family Search while at home and you can't get to that image, you can contact us and we can get that image for you and send it out to you. The dialogue box that comes up that says it has to say library affiliate. We are not a family history center. Sometimes a box will come up and just say family history center. Sometimes it'll say family history center and library affiliate. As long as it says library affiliate, you can contact us. So how to find out what we have, we're gonna go through our catalog, our catalog, um, is at houstonlibrary.org. You can enter a keyword, Harris County, Bond, Family, Peoria County, Revolutionary War, Ohio. It will bring up books. This is our library homepage. One of the most important things you should do is, because if you're gonna wanna engage our databases, you will need a MyLink card. From our library website, houstonlibrary.org, you can click on get a MyLink card. If you live in Texas, anybody in Texas with a Texas driver's license, a Texas address can get a Houston Public Library card. It, and that is not the, it's not that way in every public library. It is that way at Houston Public in Texas. If you live outside of Texas, you can get a six month library card for $20. You can get a year library card for $40. That will give you access to our remote databases. Get a MyLink card. From our library catalog, you can see I put an arrow there to search our catalog. One of the most important things to remember when you engage our catalog is, is we are one of 38 locations. There are three special collections, but there are 35 neighborhood libraries, including a, sense, a central library. When you do a search in our library catalog, you are searching every single location. As an example, Civil War, Tennessee, general search. I get 214 results when I do Civil War, Tennessee in our library catalog. On the left-hand side of those results, there is a link there for library and you can limit it down to Clayton. So that gets rid of all the other books that are in the neighborhood libraries and that are not at Clayton. When you limit it down to Clayton, it pulls it back to 77 results. Those 77 results are the books that we have at Clayton. Those other books, because I was doing a keyword search, are either at the neighborhood libraries, but are not at Clayton. So those other 100 and whatever. So remember that our catalog is a system-wide catalog, limit it down. When you find something that you're looking for, you then again, as we're closed right now, you can call us, you can, you can email us and give us information about that book. Be very specific and we will look in it for you, but you have to be specific. We will call you also and have a dialogue with you um, to get down to your research question also. The Houston Public Library subscribes to about oh, 150 maybe plus databases. Most of those databases are general databases, but of course we have genealogy databases. When you go to our library website at houstonlibrary.org and click on research, you get to genealogy, you can pick on those. 
Also notice that there are other databases, resources by category. Know that you can look in the social sciences, know that you can look in the history categories, know that you can look in the newspaper categories for other collections, other databases that will be applicable to your research. In the encyclopedia section, there is something called the Maritime Encyclopedia, Oxford Dic Encyclopedia of Maritime History. In that encyclopedia, I put the word genealogy and up comes geneal libraries that have genealogical research that are related to maritime. So as you use genealogy, remember that there are other categories where we might find information that will give us not necessarily a name, date, and place, but might lead us to part of our story. When you click on genealogy, it takes you to the genealogy resources. And on those genealogy resources, you can see the databases that we have. We have newspapers, we have civil war. You can see that Ancestry has a remote access. You can see also we have Find My Past in Clayton only. Fold 3 is accessible from home with a library card as our um, history makers. All these remote access databases require a library card. We have MyHeritage for remote users. One of the databases that you're going to want to look at in addition to our library catalog is also our microprint collection. We have unique microfilm upstairs that we also will do limited research for you in. So in that component of genealogy and those research sources is the Clayton microprint source where you can search by location. And if you can identify something that you're interested in and ask us a specific question, we will do limited research for you during these times. So also notice that. Preparing your research question, your quest, plan your research. You want to go over your pedigree chart. You want to write down those research questions. Use your online catalogs, use your databases, use your finding aids. Anything that you can find at the library that you're researching that will help you identify what it is you want to look at. Because if you walk in the door and you say, I'm here to do my family history, our first question to you is going to be, who are you researching? What do you want to know? Where are you researching? And what time period are you researching? We're going to need to, to know that to start helping you either through information and referral, through a conversation and developing a dialogue with you to give you ideas on how to research, you need to be able to articulate that question. Doesn't matter whether you got 50 of them, because as we know in family history, once you can't find something from one, there's always another question and that's okay. But that's what makes you feel as if you're directed and you're in control of your research. I'm searching for land records in Cuyahoga County in the 1850s, Cuyahoga County, Ohio in the 1850s. I'm looking for a marriage in Peoria County around 1850. I'm looking to find out who my grandparents' parents were. Our question to you would be is where was your grandparent born and what time period? We might send you to the census. We might look to see if there's vital records, but that's why you need to articulate that question. So if you happen to have a family history research question, here is our phone number and here is our reference email. And one of the things I wanna do pretty quickly next is show you that I created a story of me without with, with just the stories that I had heard from my family. I have some documents, but most of this is a way to create a family history, even if you're not going to search the next 25 years looking for the documents to verify your family history. Joy will continue to put this up in the chat, so you'll be able to get it, and I have it at the end also. So let's talk about me for a second. Okay, I just went out on the internet and these are from stories that I had and I put together a quick little history of me. So this is a map. I went to Family Search and this is a map of Eastern Europe and I can see where my family is from because it took, it pulled the places from my, my family tree. So we have Eastern Europe, we have New York and we have Chicago. 
So this is the history of my family and the migration. The migration of my father, my father was born in Brooklyn. He lived in Brooklyn. He ended up going to Chicago. And in Chicago in the 1950s, he met, he met my mother. My father actually went to school at Northwestern University. That's what brought him to Chicago. He met my, it was actually, he met my mother's uncle who introduced him to my mother. My mother grew up near Wrigley Field in Chicago. My father went to Northwestern. My parents got divorced. My parents got married. When they got married, they lived out in Elk Grove Village up there on the left. I was born in Park Ridge, Illinois. My parents got divorced and then my mother moved to Chicago into Rogers Park. When I was growing up, my mother always said to me that I was the first red haired baby at my hospital, at the hospital. And I couldn't believe that because I mean, I mean, I understand that redheads are rare, but I just couldn't believe that I was the first red haired baby at the hospital. Well, I was born at Lutheran General. Lutheran General was in Park Ridge. I happened to look for a history of Park Ridge and you can see down on the bottom, there's a history of Park Ridge, Illinois. But it says as population grew, Park Ridge encouraged office development and allowed a limited number of partner, apartment buildings. Lutheran General moved from Chicago in 1959. I was born in March of 1960. I very well might have been the first red haired baby at the hospital. But see how what I found sort of talks about the story and is more than just March 11th, 1960 with an open dash, thank God, with an open dash. But there's the story, there's part of the story. Historical events, you can find all kinds of chronological websites on this day. You can add weather, you can add all kinds of events. On my birthday, Pioneer 5 launched. Okay, so here I was born in Elk, I mean, I lived in Elk Grove Village. Here's a little bit of information about Elk Grove Village. Elk Grove Village is right next to O'Hare Field. There's O'Hare Field in the picture of 1960. Doesn't look like that now. And when we were little, this is not me or anybody, but when we were little, Elk Grove Village has a bunch of elks and we would always go feed the elks. I lived in Chicago, 1967, the big snow. 1968, the Democratic Convention more snow. Pictures of what it looked like while I was growing up that are going to engage someone who is not necessarily interested in genealogy. The Chicago Museum of History. Here's ice skating in Lincoln Park. Although this is an early, early picture from like 1910, we ice skated in Lincoln Park. They, they froze a pond and we did that and we had that. These are some of the things that I grew up with. We had dial phones, we had push button phones. We went to the grocery store at Jewel. We were going to the Jewel. My mother had a car that's a Ford Galaxy. And we all know that I sat there in a little baby seat like that. I'm still alive, still alive. My other side, uh, well, my family is Jewish and they ended up in New York of all sides. And this might be, there's a tenement museum there's also a Philadelphia Museum of Jewish History. I went to there. I picked up a couple pictures. There's what the Seder, what the what the Shab, what the, the Shabbos table might have looked like for my ancestors. This is the 1930 census. No, this is the 1940 census. You can see right there by Emil. There's a circle with an X in it. I know that Emil gave that information. There's my father listed. He was nine. He wasn't on the 1930 census, although he was born in 1930. He wasn't born until August. The census was taken before. Nowhere in the census does it say my grandmother plus one in the 1930 census. But you can see along the census in 1930, they lived on Bedford Avenue. I went out to the internet, history of Bedford Avenue. Here's pictures from the 1940s, 1950s of Sheep's Head Bay, where my father grew up. Might have walked down that pier. Here's the, the Dodger Stadium. Might have seen that. My father was, was 17 years old in 1947. Might have walked past that. Although fuzzy, here's the Brooklyn telephone directory I got from the New York Public Library. My grandfather is listed on Bedford Avenue. It's the email there. Sorry, it's so fuzzy. Here's the New York Public Library digital collection showing Bedford Avenue. And here is my father in, I would say maybe 2010, I believe maybe, <clears throat> in front of the house. Took a picture of him, took the trip. Nobody wants to look at a pedigree chart. Everybody wants to look at pictures. 
This is naturalization of my great grandfather, Sam. This is the one whose story was that he came over from Russia in women's clothing. Naturalization says he's a ladies tailor. That immediately makes the story plausible, okay? Not necessarily true, but plausible. Again, city directories. There's Samuel Lazy Ladies Furnishings. This is from Chicago. This is again coming actually from the New York Public Library website where there are other things other than New York. I went out to Google search by address. We saw the Milwaukee address actually where his tailor shop was. There's a picture of it from the map. And here happens to be on the right hand side, a picture that my cousin sent me from I would think in the thirties. And then there is a picture from Google Maps as it looks right now. That is a family history. That is a story. That is the culmination of why we do this. And also the, the impetus for other stories and then maybe the impetus for getting the documents. I could get maybe some other city directories. I don't know if my, grand, my great grandfather owned that building. I might look for land records. But all these things, even if you don't want to get those, those vital records, if you don't want to look at all those written manuscript records, the most important thing is passing down the tradition and passing down those stories. Because that's what keeps us alive. And that's why it's important to write our story in addition to our ancestors' stories, because it keeps our families alive and it keeps our traditions alive and it keeps our own personal history alive. So there you are. Here are our upcoming programs again. On the 15th, we've got Natalie McLean, Why You Need a Library Card. We've got our African-American history celebrations coming up. You can register for those two presentations for Natalie and for Franklin Smith on the 5th. Registration is going to be opening soon. Um, the library is going over to a new web platform, so you just have to keep checking back. I'm sorry you're calling us um, and asking us about registration. There Hi, Sue. If I can interrupt for a second. Yes. Um, during your presentation, we've actually opened up registration for three of those talks <gasps> uh, using manuscript collections some great and seldom used African-American resources and naturalization. We hope to have the other up soon. Oh, wow, Joy. That's, ah. <laughs> that's like on the television. <laughs> you should have got one of those things, just breaking news. <laughs> By the way, for those of you who are interested, this is my colleague, Joy, here at Clayton. We have our colleague, Mitch, also, and then uh, from Clayton, and then, of course, our HPL side, Justin, who we would not be able to do these with, with, with these people helping us. So um, I, hope, I hope that I know that it's a lot of stuff. I know that it's overwhelming and I know that you're probably even more confused, maybe, or at least trying to figure out where to begin, where to begin, your pedigree chart, your questions, get a library card, play with some of our databases, play on family search. We invite you to call us. We invite you to email us and we will help you. That's what we're here for. And if you're interested in having us do a presentation for your group, Call or send us an email and we can do that. We have other presentations that we can provide a list with. So I hope everybody got something out of it and um, save, save the family and save your traditions. It's really important, really important. So what kind of questions do we have, you guys? We have any. Well, so yeah, we do have, we do have a few questions here. Okay. Um, let's see. We have a question from Kathy, uh, going back to when you were talking about some of the World War II and the military records. She wanted to know if a World War II military record would show dependence, but she's looking for birth parents. I, and I will take help from, from uh, Joy or Mitch also. I, I, the document, unless it, unless it might list a next of kin, you know, or somebody to contact, that might be the way that I can think that a military record is going to list parents. Well, I, well I'm, I'm thinking of the, um, the access that we have on Ancestry to the uh, World War II uh, draft registration documents. 
Now, depending on the uh, age of the uh, the draftee, they may be at home and they may list their one of their parents as uh, their contact. I know I've had some people that did that. Some that were a little bit older were married, would list a spouse, uh, but then some would list a mother or a father as their contact. And those are the uh, registration. And those are available on. Right, right. Those are available yeah. through either Ancestry or uh, Fold3, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not familiar with a lot of the of a lot of other World War II documents. Yeah, I you know, um, Irene hasn't done her military presentation for a while. I personally have not seen dependents on any military records. Um, that's just my experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unless it unless it would be like as I mentioned, you know, like with a with a Civil War pension, you know, I mean, there might be a widow, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, in, the, in in those documents, but um, I, I think is, but it would have to be as an attachment of next of kin or receivers. I would think would be a way to describe it. Probably that's the function that it would probably have for mm -hmm. them taking that information, right? Mm -hmm. What else? Okay, um, I have a question from Iris, uh, who asks, what is a wiki? A wiki is like an encyclopedia. Um, it's an interactive encyclopedia. What, 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 look up the definition. Let's see. Wiki. <laughs> what do you see on my computer right now? We're seeing your your um google search presentation oh you're still seeing my presentation okay <laughs> well that's good then you can't see how i'm fumbling <laughs> around but um <laughs> here what wiki means a wiki is a website that allows users to add and update content on the site using their own web browser but it basically is like an encyclopedia it's it's, it, a, it's like a group uh, a group a crowdsourced effort. yeah crowdsourced yeah. Yeah. a crowdsourced encyclopedia yes mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. Um, and so Mildred followed that up with a question, uh, any comments uh, or comments on Wikitree, the, the site Wikitree? Mitch, do you have any comments on Wikitree? I do not use Wikitree. I, I've used it. It's, um, I, I wouldn't recommend it as a place to begin, although they do, they do uh, uh, encourage that. Uh, it's pretty, it's, there's a lot of information on the page. It's kind of hard to find your way through it, I, I, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, but there are there are a lot of serious uh, 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 genealogists on that website. Uh, it is a it is a good place. So you can put family information, uh, trees, things like that. It, they they um, uh, you can make it private. You can share it. You can uh, look for people that are work, working on the same families, things like that. It's a good as the name Wiki implies. It's a good community group. But uh, I just find that I find the presentation to be a little difficult to deal with. Great. But everybody, your mileage may vary, as, as, they, as they say. <laughs> so um, uh, we have a question from uh, uh, Joe Don. Uh, uh, and I think Joy may have asked this or answered this. He, uh, he asked, he said his library card is a power card. Uh, he wanted to know if that was the same thing as a library card. I believe Joy answered him. Uh, in the in the comments saying that the, if it's a power card, it's probably been uh, outdated and needs to be uh, renewed. Yep. Mm -hmm. So you can go online and just go ahead and enter your information. Yes. Right, right, right. Library cards are only good for three years. Mm -hmm. um, so now I have another question here from um, Mildred, um, who asks, what is the best way to read the census documents without having vision issues? Well, that's an, that's an interesting comment. I will say that census documents will vary from website to website, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know that some of the resolution is different. Mm -hmm. There is that. Now, there, there, the, the only option that I can think of yeah. would be that for some places, uh, for, uh, especially for like uh, the earlier census, you will find people who had gone through or have gone through and done uh, extractions, uh, right. extracted all the information and put it into a more readable form 
for you. Um, uh, that you that is usually a lot easier to read, although you are uh, taking the chance that they made a, a mistake during the extraction. But if it's unreadable, you know, what are your chances of, of extracting it either? So you could use our online catalog to see if we have a transcription of that census. Mm -hmm. Um, the other sure. thing to do would be is there also is a website called the U.S. Gen Web. Mm -hmm. It's usgenweb.com, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. So usgenweb.com. And it is a geographic driven website. So by individuals and by societies, there might be some transcriptions there also. But I think, you know, I mean, is it the handwriting I'm wondering or is it the viewing on the on the computer? Uh, that, yeah, she doesn't. She yeah. she doesn't say. Um, mm -hmm. And there there is a suggestion from Sharis in uh, Sharis. I, I, I combined her first and last name from Sharon in the chat, uh, saying to use printable forms to transcribe the the census information uh, in, into a printed form. Uh, and Mildred is clarifying. She is saying it's the viewing on the computer that uh, she's having yeah. an issue with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Now, I will say that in, in a lot of cases, like with Ancestry and with Family Search, when you do find a page, they do offer uh, uh, extraction of a lot of that data is right there. It's available there. There is, a, there is an index at the bottom on Ancestry for most census pages. It'll give uh, a printed version instead of the manuscript version that you see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, and Ancestry and... Mm -hmm. I don't know if it happens in family search, but in ancestry too, there's that first page, you know, and mm -hmm. right when you go in down on the bottom, there is a, mm -hmm. sometimes you only run into the indexed fields that mm -hmm. index and they might not have indexed the whole thing, but yeah. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Mary in chat also recommends enlarging the image on the computer. That's also something that could mm -hmm. be done as well. Mm -hmm. Um. um so we have a, a question here from, uh, or a comment from Gaden, who says that, uh, that, that you showed us a cool way to view our family history and that uh, you got a lot of great ideas and that loves, loves a story. Everyone loves a story. So <laughs> kudos to you on presenting it that way. Yeah. And then uh, uh, Gaden also conf uh, followed up with, um, uh, it wants to know this presentation uh, with the PowerPoint, will it be available on YouTube channel or where will it be available? It will be. We recorded it. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is, is we have to send it up to, to the next level above us and then it'll be mounted. So you'll go to uh, joy to houstonlibrary.org or to, to YouTube and then just search Houston Library. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then they'll all come up. You have to search the word, you have to search, go to YouTube or search Houston Library and then put in the word genealogy. There are some um, inconsistencies in the titling of our presentation. So we're gonna try and work on that. I haven't had an opportunity to talk to Joy about that yet. It looks like, uh, Sue, it looks like they're called HPL resource slash Clayton Library and then oh. the title. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. Is part of being a larger organization. So I and they all look the same. The, the, the screens look the same. They all have HPL resources and they look they're all orange, right? So yeah, they all look the same. I do have another uh, another thing here from um, DEPR three three six one six in chat. Who uh, I, I, I she may be talking about or this person may be talking about. Um, uh, finding de uh, dependents, things like that. Uh, it says, parents info, check the siblings in census to see who is living with them uh, mm -hmm. post census years. Okay. Also check city directories for your ancestors. Then check the address list to see who else is living at that address at the time, possibly relations. Um, that is a good, a good tip for using the city directory as a lot of city directories will have a reverse lookup in, uh, in the, the, the second half of the, uh, of the city directory where you can look up the address. Mm -hmm. And sometimes mm -hmm. that will tell you who is actually living at that address. Whereas right. the, the direct lookup would just tell you the name of one person and the, uh, maybe the spouse 
and the address by looking up the address you can you can get the names of of everybody in the household and for some of you that might not be familiar with city directories they're kind of like phone books where there's an alphabetic section by name and then um, as they get a little more recent like in the 20s that you know there's an alphabetic section by street where Mitch is talking about where you can see who was living in the household at that time period um, a lot of them have been digitized there's a city directory component at ancestry and I believe there's some at family search also mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. This is what's really good about doing these presentations because, and this is what we all really like, I think, the, the mind hive, if you will, that sits out there listening to us, you know, can be very helpful to everybody that's attending. So we appreciate all those comments. Well, I do have one more person just added. Um, Mary asks, um, if they send a retirement card to, uh, for, to Franklin, uh, will we pass it along to him? Yes, I will. Yes, we will. <laughs> Yes, we will. What a guy, frankly. So, anything else? Uh, I just got something from um, Iris asking, how did you download the pictures into the slideshow? Well, I, I copy them and paste them onto the, onto the PowerPoint. Everything that I do, I just copy and paste. Hmm. So I have these, like the screenshots and everything. I'll take a, there's something called a snipping tool that I use you can mm -hmm. take a print screen and then you just copy it and then just put it up on the slideshow on the, on the, on the PowerPoint slide. Mm -hmm. So, okay. That's, that's, that's all I have. Okay. Well, all right, you guys. So the next one is joy. You want to talk, you want to say anything on the 15th about Natalie? We're excited to have Natalie. Yeah, we're excited to have Natalie to speak about uh, the benefits of a library card, all the free work, free resources that will be available to you in your genealogy research. So check it out. Great, great. And that is next Friday, right? Wow. Yes, next Friday at two o'clock. And next Friday is the middle of January already. So, okay. <laughs> All right, you guys, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for co continuing to support these Clayton Library Presents and uh, write down those stories and call us if you need us. We'd love to talk to you. Thank you, you guys. Bye.